Uh, my name is Taryn. I'm with Occupy Missoula, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. My name is Kevin Gastola, and I blog at The Dissenter at firedoglake.com. Great. Uh, so I was going to – I want to talk to you about, um, you know, you've been involved really since the very beginning um, covering – live blogging this movement, but I, I really had to start with last night because it was so dramatic. So if you could just tell us, uh, you were in Washington Square last night. Were you also at Times Square at all? Or Yeah, I was down in Times Square. I wasn't in Washington Square at night, but I was there in the afternoon. Okay. So if you could just tell us a bit about yesterday. Well, this mor in the morning, it was, well, to put it into perspective, it was part of the October 15th Global Day of Action. <laughs> And a lot of these events were planned ahead of time. These weren't spur of the moment. The organizers intended to be in these locations. And so uh, they started with a march on the Chase Bank b branch in the morning. And uh, they so they marched from uh, Liberty Park or Zuccotti Park. And they then left the Chase Bank branch and they headed to Washington Square and they marched uh, north. Uh, a number of blocks past Greenwich Village, and they went past New York University. And so it was, it was quite a march. It's a, about a mile and a half to get to Washington Square. It was well organized. They had an organizer who was up at the front talking to a police sergeant so that they could know exactly how to coordinate it. It stretched for about four or five blocks with maybe a 1,000 to, I don't know, 1,200 people actually being participating in the in the march. And... Uh, Everybody was kept to the sidewalk. Uh, nobody was allowed to be in the street, so they didn't uh, have them march up the street, which in some cases actually made the march slower. So they ended up at Washington Square at noon, and they had a general assembly, and they took off at about 3. Uh, now, during the afternoon, we started hearing reports of these Citibank arrests that had taken place, uh, probably some of the most controversial arrests of the day yesterday. And they didn't come from the march. They actually came from people who were trying to participate in a move your money action and close their accounts at Citibank. And uh, Citibank says that everyone was disruptive and they came in there and the security guards had to close the bank. Uh, the video suggests otherwise that people were very peaceful, that there were a handful of people that went in to close their accounts and that the guards ended up locking them into the bank so that the police could come and make arrests, and 23 people were arrested. Then the afternoon, we had a march that started to go up uh, 6th Avenue, and from 3 p.m. to about 5.30, they, they marched 20 or so blocks to Times Square. They all uh, showed up in Times Square, and there were already barricades there prepared for the occupiers who were coming in. In, the, in Times Square, there were also a 1,000 people waiting for the march. So New Yorkers who had decided they didn't want to march, but they were going to be down at Times Square to be part of the convergence. And it uh, got clogged very quickly. The march that came in came up Broadway. And then they had to redirect it around because the march didn't like that they weren't actually part of the convergence. They were off to the side, and they, they weren't really in the, in the center of the action. So they ended up getting moved up 46th Street. And, you know, I know people who aren't familiar with New York City may not know these, these locations, but they're important because the action that took place that people are hearing about from last night when there were arrests that took place, I was, I was right by there watching the police do their formations and, and discussing how they were going to handle the crowd. And they brought in the horses and at 46th and 7th Avenue, they started to uh, ram the horses into the crowd to push it back because it was getting really rowdy and, and raucous, and they wanted to, to clear it out. And that was when uh, some of the most violent arrests happened when they were going in and they pulled individuals out and had them on the ground and were uh, you know, wrestling them, and, and then they arrested and, and took some people off. Um, I think that they put the number of arrests at 70 to 100 yesterday, and I saw – where I was, I only saw less than 10 arrests. So that means that there was police action up and down a, a stretch of four or five blocks. So – and in another 
story from the night that I want to share before I conclude here is that there was an instance, and I was right there, when across the way there was a shaking of the barricade, then across the street somebody moved a barricade and the police came rushing over and it looked like all of these barricades were going to fall down right then and the police were about to you know head into the crowd if that had happened uh, but they got things under control and it just it was a very tense scene and i guess to put a conclusion on this uh, story of yesterday i would say the occupy wall street movement is very very powerful in my opinion because i thought there was going to be a mass arrest but the white shirted cops went above and beyond to defuse it and, and give the Occupy protesters an out so that they could uh, leave and disperse without any problem. And they wanted to stay on this corner in front of the TGI Friday's location and continue to hold it, and they didn't want the police to tell them to back down. But what they were able to do is, uh, is get some sort of a, a thing worked out where the police ended up letting them come join a group that was in this, uh, this I guess I'll call it the tourist area in the center of Times Square where a lot of people look out at, at the different businesses and they were able to come over and join a group. So the police basically let them leave an area that they had pinned down and, and it looked like they were going to make a mass arrest there of, of about 20 to 50 people. All right. Wow, so pretty dramatic events obviously. And where did you end the evening? And I ended the evening at about... I want to say it was close to 9 p.m., and, and by then I could tell from hearing police radios that they were headed back to Washington Square uh, that they um, brought everything under control in Times Square around 8.30. And it was actually, there was a woman, a police officer, who came over and was talking to what I assume is her husband, and she, he, would, he came to say hello, and... She's, she was asked, how long are you going to be here? And she said, I think we're going to be here till 2 a.m. And so they were prepared to be here for a long time. Also, she said, I think I'm about to be sent in to make arrests. And we were all standing there. And, you know, at any moment, they could have done something about us. I talked to a legal observer, and, and I said, do you, do you really think – that uh, they can do this, they haven't made any orders for us to disperse. And he said, well, they could technically do whatever they want because you're, they could say you're here in an area and you're unlawfully protesting and then they could start to uh, arrest you. But that didn't happen. So how did, how did you first start? You started from day one live blogging at Fire Dog Lake, didn't you? Yeah, day one. Okay. And... What was it like then? What, what do you think the big and, – and then where have you gone from there? Well, I started on day one, and personally I was uh, intrigued by the idea that people were going to occupy a park, and I, it sounded like a, a new tactic that was necessary for growing whatever kind of movement people were going to have against uh, – well, I'll just say corporate greed and corruption for, for lack of a better term – uh, or way to actually encapsulate all the different issues that people are tackling. And the movement started very small. You know, it was like 50 to 100 people who actually tried to stay in the park. And uh, those people were really the vanguard of something that has grown into a really huge moment. Uh, I mean, I, I flip back and forth. I hesitate to call it a movement, and then the next day I want to call it a movement, but but I still think that we are still in a moment where uh, things are just growing and we haven't really solidified the movement yet. So anyways, the blogging that I've been doing, I've done for over 28 days now, as long as the occupation has been going on. And I tracked it at the dissenter. It started, it started to get a lot of traffic because people were hungry for information about the Occupy Wall Street protest. The first week was a total media blackout. I think there was maybe 1% of media coverage actually went towards mentioning the Occupy Wall Street protest. It took to the pepper until the pepper spraying uh, by the officer 
Tony Baloney, <laughs> as they call him, uh, until they pepper sprayed the female protesters on the sidewalk there, the protests were getting really no attention. And then they saw the mass arrest on the Brooklyn Bridge of 700 people. And as I talked to other reporters who have covered this closely in New York City, uh, for example, uh, Ryan Devereaux of Democracy Now! has been right. a, a really good uh, person covering, and, and I've talked to him, and he, he's, we've actually kind of become uh, colleagues and friends through coverage of Occupy Wall Street. And he says that he believes it really changed. The, the momentum really started to pick up after the Brooklyn Bridge arrests. And they were picking up union endorsements before then, uh, like the, the, the TWU, the Transit Workers Union here in New York City. But after that mass arrest, you really saw a lot of the unions getting on board. You also started to see Democratic Party uh, and liberal groups joining in. So, so now at this point, what I've been doing is touring occupations and uh, being funded by Fire Dog Lake to go around and do reporting. And so far I've seen Occupy Philly, Occupy DC, and I got to go to Occupy Boston for a couple days. And I had already seen Occupy Chicago because I'm based in Chicago. And uh, it looks like they've been growing and have a lot of momentum behind them. And one of the things they benefited from was this Mortgage Bankers Association uh, conference that was held there, which brought a lot of unions in the bus people and and gave them a, a surge of energy. And the action at the Mortgage Bankers Association got an extra boost because of the Occupy protests. So it looked like this was part of Occupy Wall Street, but it would have happened regardless. And uh, just last night, it appears they tried to occupy Grant Park and have an occupation. About 175 people were arrested for violating the park curfew. Wow. Uh, I want to back up just a little. Um, I was going to mention, first of all, that Ryan Devereaux is, does amazing Twitter coverage, um, just kind of in the moment encapsulating what's going on, has done some of the best Twitter coverage, I think. Uh, and then I was – when exactly – you wrote, I think, one of the first – kind of full-throated defenses of the occupation. And Glenn Greenwald picked it up and really, I think, kind of turned the left in terms of opinion. When was that in that timeline? Uh, I would say it was in the second week, I believe, okay. that, that, I, that I had written it. Um, and I don't remember the exact day, but I'll just... Uh, I'll link, the, and I'll make sure to link that piece. But oh, thank you. Go on, yeah. And... What I was just responding to was how there were liberals that I could tell had this elitist mentality towards the protests that were going on where they were suggesting that there needed to be a message, they needed to make demands, uh, they needed to wear suits, they needed to look better, uh, they needed to do all these things, and yet these were people who didn't seem to want to go out and participate in the protests, and as far as I could tell, they weren't working to build any Occupy protests in their community, and they weren't going to New York to cover and do reporting. They were just giving their critique, some of them even going as far as to say, you know, this is why I don't do protests, because I don't think they are effective. So, uh, and these are people who... In my opinion, their version of creating change is, is limited to going to conferences and having discussions and perhaps signing petitions and maybe making calls to representatives and having protests on uh, the state capitol doorsteps, which I think it's good to have, cap uh, you know, you want to do protests at the state capitals and, and everything, but it's uh, there's not a lot of room for creativity from... And that's what this has been, this organic grassroots movement has been creative, really opening up the possibilities for protest. Maybe if we can just go through each of the cities that you've been to um, since then, one by one a little bit. Yeah, and uh, I've been to Occupy Philly, and there in Occupy Philly they have about, uh, when I was there they had about 75 to 80 tents that they had set up, and they're alongside City Hall. Okay. They're set up there, and uh, 
like Occupy Wall Street, they have set up tents that can provide services. So they have a food tent that's feeding people. They have two medical tents. They have a, a sanitation tent that keeps the area clean. And they have a, uh, they also have a kids zone. They've set up this area for families to bring children to, to play. And they've started to build structures out of uh, cardboard. So they're getting uh, creative and they're beginning to think about how to weatherize so that they could stay longer into the winter. And they also have a library, which is something that Occupy Wall Street has too, but a lot of these other occupations are setting up libraries and getting books donated. And uh, that's what I really saw from Occupy Philly is when I really began to understand was that part of this was a reclamation of space. And, and I kind of could tell from the Occupy Wall Street that coming into this private public park, it's really about the people having control over public space. But it's also really clear in front of City Hall that they want to be able to have this community and build it and lots of political discussion and they created art. They have lots of art uh, supplies there for people to come down and make signs. After Philly, I headed to Wall Street, uh, but I'll backtrack and just uh, mention Occupy DC because that's where I was there. I was in town to cover October 2011, uh, Stop the Machine protests, which are loosely affiliated, but as kind of this other thing that probably should be covered separately. But at the same time, they are kind of, in a way, helping to reinforce the Occupy DC protest. And the Occupy DC occupation is in McPherson Square. And there's a few, I'd say there's now a few hundred people that are paying attention closely and when I was there, there were uh, there was a group that was sleeping in McPherson Square, and the one thing that I did note was becoming problematic for the occupiers was that the uh, police in D.C. would come by at 5 a.m. in the morning and wake everybody up, mm-hmm. and uh, then I don't know if they were able to go back to sleep or not, but it was just it was really weird and, and strange, and uh, then there they've done some actions. But they're really getting off the ground. They're starting to build. I think when I left, they were just beginning to get like a generator and to start to become permanent, uh, start to have a permanent presence in DC. And this is and this is separate. So the uh, so the October 2011 is separate from the McPherson Park. Yes. And they remain separate. They remain separate. It's about four blocks apart too. Okay. There's and not much. Was there some between. talk of them combining? No, because these okay. are different. These are different sets of organizers, and I think there's, uh, you know, with October 2011, you have the seasoned activists who are very experienced, right. and then in McPherson Square, you have a lot of young people who are tapping into the Occupy Together movement that has risen up, and so it's um, it, it's very interesting because in, in many cases you're seeing. A, in my opinion, a, a section of activists that want to be at the forefront of this movement and, and be the face of it, and they're not willing to, to, to get behind the momentum of all these young people that's building in, in the park nearby. And, and I think personally that there's, they have siphoned off some of the energy that could be going into Occupy DC. So that's not to say that they shouldn't be there protesting, but they have gone ahead and gotten a four-month permit so that they can be in Freedom Plaza. So they'll be there into February. And so they have security, which is something that McPherson Square does not have. So they should find a way that they can help reinforce McPherson Square because I think that, you know, in my opinion, I really like the idea of struggling to reclaim public space to even take it back from a private park. So if you're having instances where you do see arrests of 100, 200 people, you go there and you keep going back until you force the city to let you remain and hold your encampment because then you can claim victory and you can continue to build your occupation. Right. There's, and, and I think you'll hear a lot of people who maybe were involved early on emphasize that it's, there's a political protest aspect, and then there also is the occupation aspect. There's the reclamation of the public space. That's a separate. That's a important part to understand. It's important to what 
is being done. I mean, I think that if you listen to like David Graeber speak, he'll talk about, you know, trying to build a society that mirrors the society that you want to create. That that, and, and also, um, and, and reclaiming, reclaiming space and giving the protesters a way of um, bonding, I guess. And would you have anything to add to that? I mean, is that, you think that's an, you obviously think that's an important part of what's happening. Definitely. Because occupation is a strategy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that captures the horizontalism that they are, you know, as, a, as I understand, they're inspired by a book. I haven't read it, but it, it really stems from the Argentinian uprisings uh, that took place in the early 2000s. And uh, it, the book is called Horizontalism. I forget the author. But uh, she's... We'll, we'll link you know, that. We'll link and, that. And she's been on Democracy Now. Right. I, right. I did see her on Democracy Now, so we'll make sure to link that book. Okay. And so... Uh, and, and I do want to mention, just for people who don't know, the... The Occupy Wall Street movement and the October 2011 movement were developing for months ahead of time separate from one another. Well, right? well, so October 2011 started, I knew about it in May or right. even June. Occupy Wall Street developed, I want to say, around maybe June or July. July was the Adbusters ad. Ju yeah, okay, so they announced and... You know, what people should understand is what is now has, what now has the potential to give Democratic Party politicians a boost came from some, uh, an ad busters call to action, some members of Anonymous, and this little group called US Days of Rage that put together this website that could facilitate meetups and, uh, and it was uh, a person who was uh, from New York, who I happen to know, uh, named Alexa O'Brien, who uh, was behind the scenes just kind of talking to organizers and, and seeing how she could do some stuff electronically on the Internet to help with the growing of the movement. And it, it, was, it was very small. It was just people who basically had the guts to go out there and start something and uh, didn't ask first, didn't think about history and, and how – Certain protest actions haven't worked before. They just went and did it, and and then now we've seen it's a phenomenon, and it's the top story on news, on local news, not just like national news, but on on local news. Right. Um, and that, and I just heard recently, and I've heard it a few times mentioned that the um, Occupy Wall Street movement, at least in the early days, that there was a lot of Bloomberg bill participants? Are you were you aware of that or I wouldn't be surprised. The early tactic okay. the early tactic that they wanted to use was a bit convoluted and was probably going to fail had they actually used it because it was so easy for the police to disperse. They wanted to uh, use a, a law that is on the books in New York City and has actually been litigated and, and it came down in the favor of people who wanted to occupy public sidewalks. So as long as they didn't block pedestrian traffic, they could lay out sleeping bags on a sidewalk. And I think this is something that Bloombergville used. There's a test video that went up before Occupy Wall Street started, and you'll see that people are arrested, and they're down in the financial district on the sidewalk, and the police don't let them stay. And it was kind of, I guess, a preview of what could have happened. But again, the area of Wall Street has been fortified. It's uh, it's like, like like a green zone now with all this security. And you have to actually show your worker's ID. That's a new thing. In the past, like, four or five days, they've made it so if you want to go through uh, the, the – if you want to actually get down to Wall Street or in front of the New York Stock Exchange, you have to show that you actually work on Wall Street. They used to just let anybody walk down there so long as you weren't carrying a sign and you were demonstrating. Uh, so – it's, I mean, there, there's a level of security for the banks that is very telling about the, the way that resources are being allocated to protect the, the financial elites in this country. So before we move on to the other occupations that you've covered, um, 
and maybe we're jumping in a little, but there's the, a big debate on the left has been whether there should be concrete demand. And I think you've come down on the not demand side. Is that correct? Well, I think that by not having demands, they're actually able to grow. And right. I think one of the issues that has been raised, and I believe it was, um, I'm going to say it's Arun Gupta from The Independent who uh, suggested that if they did have demands, this is something that I, de I, I developed this too before I read this article, but I'm just saying that you know other people have thought that if they did make a demand, what if it was the wrong demand, and then their movement was impacted by a debate over, you know, is that the right demand? They want to tax millionaires, but maybe that shouldn't be the top demand. Maybe the top demand should be we want jobs. Well, maybe jobs shouldn't be the top demand. We want a perp walk for Wall Street criminals. So then you get into this lousy debate about what the movement should be advocating first, and it doesn't really give the movement room to grow because you've got people who maybe think, like, we need to take on the Federal Reserve, and then they don't want to come down and occupy Wall Street because they're not sure that the movement's going to listen to what they would like to do. So here, without demands, they've created this umbrella, and... It, I mean, it's really amazing. The We Are the 99% message has actually done what a lot of progressive Democrats have wanted, which is to reset the debate. I mean, for the first time, we're hearing media discussions that don't just talk about the economy in terms of tax and spending um, and in terms of how are we going to pay down the debt and the deficit. We've now got media that is at least paying lip service to this idea of uh, – the 99% and what they don't get and then what the 1% get and talking about the income inequality in the country and maybe being condescending and scornful toward the idea that the country is being divided like that by the Occupy Wall Street movement, but at the same time addressing the concerns of the protesters and, and at least mentioning to Americans that there is this really dark and, and stark income inequality gap, and that something has to be done. So, and I'm just going to clarify that when you're referring to the We Are 99%, uh, there's a Tumblr, and I'll link to that as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's a really good, that has individual testimonials that I think is a good entry for anybody interested in understanding what the movement's about. Would you agree? I, I would agree, and I think that this is uh, something that has helped frame the message because if you, I mean, the message really is either, I mean, okay, so to backtrack, everyone says there's no message, which is something that I also took on because I think that there is a message. I mean, it's quite obvious that if they're occupying Wall Street, so some people also say, what are they protesting? Well, they're occupying Wall Street. So it shouldn't take anyone who has no brains, you know, everybody should be able to tell that they're, they're protesting Wall Street. Now we can talk about the sort of specifics of what they're protesting, but it's clear that in some way Wall Street has upset these people. So it shouldn't be a question of, like, what are they protesting? And then additionally, the message issue has been they don't have a message. But, the, but they do have a message, which is that we are the 99%. People have argued that this doesn't go anywhere, that we are the 99% can't produce any sort of results. It's just sort of a banner for people to organize under. But I think in, in many cases, the we are the 99% helps reinforce the discussion about the sort of demands that could be made in the future. And I, I think the one thing that I didn't say when we were talking about the demands issue is that you, you can bargain too early, and you can start to uh, make compromises with power before you actually have enough power to change the, the dynamics of the system, which is really what they're trying to change. Uh, they're trying to change a broken, corrupt system. And in my opinion, in Wisconsin, the large uprising that happened got involved in electoral politics too early because they decided that they were going to do a recall election for Governor Scott Walker. And Governor Scott Walker may be recalled, but what they don't know is what they could have accomplished had they continued to sustain a protest, had they kept things up, had they decided that they were going to aim a little bit higher and actually do something that would ensure that they 
didn't just defend the unions and the social welfare programs that they had in the state, but that they maybe also tried to strengthen them and grow them out. Because I don't think that we get anywhere if we just say that we have a right to keep these programs going. They're being attacked relentlessly by the right wing, and they're being attacked relentlessly by corporate hucksters who think that these things shouldn't exist because they would rather them be privatized so they could make profits. And if we let that go without pushing back and introducing our vision for how they could be more robust, then we actually cede power to them because they're going to control the debate. They're going to we're going to talk about everything in terms of why they should exist rather than talking about, um, you know, rather than forcing them to defend why they should not exist. Because I think they should be forced to explain why there shouldn't be funding of these programs. I don't think that it should be us who has to say why there should be health care for people and why there should be education and why unions should exist and why people should not have to live in, in massive debt. And then the second point that you made, which I also agree with, I think that the person that put it best was Naomi Klein, yes. which is to say it would be foolish right now to make demands because we don't know how big we are. We don't know what our power is. And so, you know, the size of the movement will determine the scope of the demand. And so to make demands too early would be to negotiate too soon, as you're saying. Right. But I also think by not making demands, you sort of – have a way of making power tremble because they don't know what they can offer to make people go away. And and so you see some Democratic politicians scrambling to figure out how they're going to channel the energy. And you have people introducing legislation that they hope will appease the people who are protesting, but it isn't good enough. I mean, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the DNC chairman, she went on MSNBC and actually said that they're going to be getting – organized and pushing Richard Cordray for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And I just thought this spoke to how tone deaf or lost the Democrats are because that is not going to be something that they can give to the occupiers to satisfy the discontent that they actually have. Uh, also, I noted that if, if that's the thing that they're going to get people organized around, they're going to have this issue with the fact that Elizabeth Warren wasn't put up as the nominee and that Barack Obama never really used the bully pulpit to argue that she should have been the nominee. So, I mean, here's the problem, that there's all these contradictions that arise from the Democrats getting involved and supporting this occupation because they haven't been good on Wall Street and issues and, and, and until they admit that there's a lot more that they should have been doing those people down in Occupy Wall Street are going to be very rejecting of both parties. So where do you see the movement going at this point? I think that, uh, well, well, two things. I think, one, they have uh, an obstacle ahead of them, which is how they're going to handle the weather, because they have to figure out how they're going to get the – continue to the core group. I, I actually think that there will continue to be an occupation in the park and that there will, there will be a way developed to continue on through the winter. And, you know, we might be surprised. We could still be talking about this in the spring. If they make it to the spring, that's really amazing because they're going to be able to grow and, and, and keep heading on in through the election. And then that raises a new host of issues because usually – in an election year, movements like this just get corralled in, in the voting and they just they dissipate. They don't they're no longer existent. And you I know this from experience from following the anti war movement. Usually there is no anti war movement in an election year because they are told not to protest or, or they're asked by their the lead organizers to to not protest just so that they can give Democrats the space they need to get elected. And I think that in the park right now that the mo movement is, you know, as I said, figuring out a way to overcome the cold. And then secondly, I do feel like eventually they will offer their demands, and I do think that they are in the process of, of figuring out when they would offer such an agenda. 
For the time being, there are a number of commentators that are already offering up their own demands. Uh, Matt Taibbi put together the five that he thinks. I uh, just heard, saw today that Senator Bernie Sanders has issued a, a white paper that lays out his recommendations for the things that Occupy Wall Street could support. So there's another reason why they wouldn't make demands, because the people who really do hold uh, ex are actually experts on the issues who actually are in positions of power where they could start to make influence are providing them the ideas that they could seize upon and start to say, well, yeah, I think Occupy Wall Street stands for that and, w and would like to see that happen. Uh, and actually, I see this movement, to, to conclude this, as being perhaps one of the decisive factors in getting money out of politics. I know that Dylan Radigan has used the movement to advance his uh, Get the Money Out of Politics campaign, and you know some people might regard that as co-opting the movement, but I just I sort of see him just taking advantage of a, of a moment and, and not necessarily trying to go in there and, and say, I'm going to lead Occupy Wall Street into my campaign. I think that what Occupy Wall Street does is, it, as it continues to grow, it creates this climate for all these things that happen that could have never been possible before it existed. So Occupy Wall Street may not get all of the utopian goals that they want. They may not lead us into that new society that the General Assembly is imagining for us all and, and offering to us as a uh, possibility, but we could get, as a side effect, things like, well, they're going to pass this law so that money donations are limited for campaigns, or they're going to pass this tax on Wall Street speculation, things that the system does to respond to the existence of the movement. How about you? Where are you going to be? Are you going to continue to cover it? Well, definitely. I, I think I'll be watching. And uh, as so long as people want to support the reporting that I'm doing, uh, I'm here on funding. And I assume that if people enjoy reading the coverage, I'll be able to pick up some more donations and uh, people will, will keep me here. Uh, the one thing that I am concerned about and I, I think I would state this to people who may see me leave Occupy Wall Street in the next couple of days. I'm only interested in going away from New York City, not because I don't think this is an amazing occupation that I would like to be a part of, but I think that all the media congregating around New York City takes away from the fact that what we are dealing with now is a national movement, and people should go see these other occupations that have sprung up around. They're very strong. Occupy LA is getting uh, very big, and I, I recommend looking at Lisa Derrick's reporting. She's been doing a day-by-day -day coverage of it, and uh, she's with Fire Dog Lake. She blogs at Lafiga, L-A-F-I-G-A, and uh, she is, you know, a citizen-type uh, journalist just uh, doing coverage, and all of these places like Occupy Seattle, Occupy Austin, Occupy St. Louis even, Occupy Atlanta, and Occupy Denver. These are, these are important occupations that people should be bringing, especially when we see the police going in to do raids of the camps. And then I think we need to be there because if we are able to show that the police are forcing a, a peaceful protest out and, uh, and if, if we can't really f figure out why the city wouldn't form some kind of compromise to let them stay. Because what people should know is, like, in Philadelphia, well, actually, even in L.A., the city council has passed a resolution to support the presence. So it is possible for these cities to pass some kind of a protection order so that people can stay in the park, even if the space had a curfew or something. And I think that one of the things we can cover and push for is that other cities, bigger cities, smaller cities even that don't usually have protests would give that kind of opportunity to people to be a part of this movement because it is, uh, it's allowing a lot of people who are frustrated and angry a way to uh, start to participate in uh, the discussion and, and shift the democracy that we have and, and make some kind of an impact with the control that we have 
uh, from corporations, it's totally impossible for us to vote and actually make a change because politicians just join the system. No matter how progressive you are, you're overwhelmed by the fact that you have to raise money and money and more money and you have these donors that you have to cater to. And Obama has figured this out himself. He's got to be funded by Wall Street in order to win elections. So he has to pick people who are advisors from these banks like Goldman Sachs. And then in the White House, he is handicapped and he can't do anything to help us at all. And until we change that system, it doesn't matter if it's a Democrat or a Republican. We're going to get really awful policies of austerity and we're going to get policies that cater to corporate banksters and casino capitalists on Wall Street. And this will, this will be my last question. We've already gone longer. Is I could talk to you all day. Um, what, and, and you kind of answered it, but what do you see as the role of the other smaller occupations? Well, one, I've noticed that they have a utility in that they give the local news channels a reason to report on Occupy Wall Street in New York. I don't think that, like, let's say, for example, where I'm from, South Bend, Mishawaka, Indiana, would have on uh, WNDU, which is an NBC affiliate, any reporting on Occupy Wall Street if there weren't people out, like maybe even just 10 to 20 people out with signs on the road protesting and they don't have an occupation, but they at least went out in protest, and so the local news channel goes down to cover and does a report. And then people get to hear about the wider story in New York City, and then in yesterday they probably got to hear about the protests worldwide. So they know that this is something bigger, and it's not just, oh, a union was out and was upset about something. They were saying there was a war on their union. So it's... It does that for the movement. It gives coverage so that more people in the United States are aware of it. We've seen that about 80% actually know of the Occupy Wall Street movement. And uh, I think that the smaller movements also can help to give people a way to participate in the movement. We can't all go to New York City. And even if you could, I would suggest that you don't. I would say... There are plenty of people in New York City. The park is in, often over capacity. And as much as that's where the celebrities and the bigger political groups are gravitating toward, you should stay in your community and build up something there. Because what this is about is, is not about getting into the limelight of the media. It's about changing the society. So that has to begin at home. You can't travel to New York City because when you get back home, you'll still have those problems that you left when you headed to New York City. So you should grow something locally, and you should start to respond to, to local issues with your uh, occupation and talk about the corporate greed and the corruption that's there at home. I mean, I'll just note briefly, I don't need to get into the issues deeply, but in Atlanta, they have chosen to rename the park that they are occupying, Troy Davis Park. Obviously, a response to the killing of Troy Davis by Georgia, which happened in the, uh, I think it was the second week or first week of Occupy Wall Street. And so what you see is people having a way to participate in this movement and give it more of a dimension. And, and I think people should be willing. I don't think it has to just be about Wall Street. Wall Street in general is a symbol of uh, greed and corruption in this country, and I think people abroad recognize it like that. But uh, we can't just have people in New York City. There has to be people all over who are taking the risks to build occupations and encampments. Otherwise, if uh, New York falls, if Bloomberg and uh, Brookfield Properties come up with a viable way to drive people out, then you see the end of this moment. And I think what I'm really advocating here is that if Occupy Wall Street was forced to disperse, they wouldn't ha we wouldn't have a problem because there would be many occupations all over the country. And the people in New York would know that they had a responsibility to get back there and, and, and set back up and, and that we would all show solidarity and give support for people to keep fighting Bloomberg 
and and Brookfield properties and any money that's coming from J.P. Morgan Chase to fund the NYPD, and then we wouldn't just be at this moment. We would actually be a movement. Right. And so does it look to you like the plan at all of the various occupations that you've been to is to make it through the winter? I'm not sure what the plan is, but I think <laughs> I would assume that if, if they want to keep this up, they'd have to figure out a way to stay warm. And I know that it's possible. Um, you know, there are things that you can do, practically speaking, and and hopefully at Fire Dog Lake we'll start to have posts that are practical, that aren't just about the politics of the protest, but do give how-tos on things you can do to stay warm. Uh, that's one of the ideas that I've had, and I think that there are people who are part of the Fire Dog Lake team that would be uh, fit to to do these sort of how-to posts, you know, like how to keep your hands warm, how to sleep in the park and, and not get hypothermia. I mean, you, you really have to be careful because there was actually an incident where one person was sleeping on the pavement and, you know, overnight got into this condition where I think they had to call it an EMT. And uh, we don't want that to happen. We don't want anybody to, to do that. Uh, and the one key reason is if they don't find a way to handle the weather and stay safe, then the NYPD will have a justification to disperse the park because they can say that the protesters are a hazard to themselves. So they really have to find a way that they can convince the city that they have thought about how they are going to protect everyone from the cold weather. And if they aren't able to present uh, this sense that they understand what to do, then that is the one way that the city is going to be able to force them out because no matter how public the the park is and and how open the city has been to to letting them stay they'll get rid of them because people will be risking their safety well thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us and uh, keep up the good work and I will make sure to link everyone to you at the dissenter thank you